Welcome everybody. This is the first lecture on the advanced track for the Linux SM and TCAL. Um, I'm Bernard and I'll be your lecturer for today. Um, and today we'll be talking about sort of the general concepts that the rest of the decal will sort of, sort of build on top of. Um, and that is mainly Unix and what Linux is and how we interact with it. So before we dive into all that, uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is just some of the administrative stuff that you guys might find useful. Um, if you're watching this in a future semester, this may not be as accurate, but most of it still stands. So as you all know, uh, this decal, like all decals, is pass, no pass. In a pass, all you really need to do is attend all the lectures, watch all the lectures um, if they're online, but attend them if uh, we have a guest lecture or something that's actually live. Um, and turn in all the labs, which are due one week from when this lecture actually goes up. Um, I believe the schedule here is that this lecture should be coming out the first Thursday the class starts. Um, because typically, when the actual lecture is in person, these lectures happen at 8 p.m. Uh, at the OCF lab itself. Uh, but since we don't really have them anymore, we'll release these lectures when that time comes. And at the same time, a lab will be released. So uh, Lab A1 should be on Gradescope as well as on our website. And you can get started on that. And that will be due in one week um, when the next lecture comes out, and the next lab comes out. So make sure to stay on top of things, as in, for 10 weeks, this stuff will sort of just be coming at you um, on a weekly basis. So we hope you enjoy it. All right, so you guys might have already recognized me uh, since I am a head facilitator this semester, um, as in I do handle a lot of the logistics and those sort of questions are probably best uh, directed at me and Ben. But there's probably also a lot of lectures that you may not have met before um, who will be giving out all the lectures you'll see um, for the rest of the semester. And while you may not know they're there or know them by name, um, all of us are reachable and online. Uh, probably the best way to sort of do that is to email us uh, if you have something official um, uh, regarding logistics or if it's something more casual or just about the course content in general, uh, feel free to drop into any of our OCF communication channels um, and jump into Decal General and send us a message. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can sort of reach us. And we're always excited to sort of hear what students are interested in, um, if you guys want to help out at the Decal, or if, there's, or if there's general feedback or course content in the lab and lectures that you would like to see changed. <clears throat> Other than that, all of our, if you haven't looked at our website before, all the material uh, from past offerings of this course can all be found there, as well as obviously the stuff that we're rolling out this semester. And lastly, even though we won't be doing live lecture, since we can't exactly get every single lecture to be free at these times to host, these, uh, to host the lectures, we'll still be having office hours and demos in person when people can actually make them. So for example, by the time this lecture goes up, I should be in this actual Zoom room um, and you can jump in and talk to me or ask me anything that you want to directly. I'd also recommend to pay attention to your emails, uh, mainly because a lot of this stuff can be due to change, whether that be our course policy or a certain date and time of things coming out. Um, so, and if we have any of those updates, we'll be sure to email everybody in the class before doing anything else. Something else to also keep an eye out for is uh, if we have guest lectures or lectures that people want to give actually live, we may actually require people to tune in to a, a, a live lecture um, at the same Zoom link. But really just to make things easier for us lectures, we've been trying to have more of these lectures recorded, um, which I think also makes it easier for you students as well. So. As far as engaging with this lecture, we have a little short URL here that you can access and follow along with the slides that I'm presenting today. Um, hopefully this URL will be updated by the time this lecture goes live, um, but it should point to the exact slides that I'm showing right now. I also recommend that you open your own terminal, um, whether it be on your own Linux or Linux or Unix-based machine. Um, and if you don't have that, you can just SSH onto the OCF SSH server directly and run your commands there. 
And I also recommend to ask questions. Uh, you won't be able to do that to me directly, but if uh, you have something you wanna ask, you can either jump into the office hours that I'm hosting at the time of this lecture dropping, um, or you can just ask online in our decal general channel, which is meant for students. So what will we be talking about today specifically? Um, the title for this lecture is an introduction to Unix, an introduction to Linux. But really what we want to describe uh, in this lecture is really what those terms sort of mean, as well as the sort of ways that you may be interacting with Linux um, and things involving Linux specifically. So probably the most obvious example of this is the shell. Uh, if you're on the advanced track, you probably have interacted with the shell yourself um, and have at least played around with it once or twice. But we'll go a little bit into the cool things that you can do as well as uh, the things that the shell actually makes possible, uh, which may be a much bigger world than you may initially realize. Um, and the lab itself will also give you a lot of practice um, with actually using the shell, as in that will be the applied part of this topic. We'll also be talking a little bit about Unix and the history of Linux itself. And we'll be looking a little bit at the design decisions that made Unix popular um, and the sort of things that still make Linux a very appealing option for people today. And lastly, we'll be talking a little bit about free and open source software, um, as in all the stuff we'll be interacting with is built on top of free and open source software, if it isn't free and open source software itself. Um, and understanding the sort of community and development that has come along with Linux itself over the past few decades. So starting off with the shell, even though everyone here is on the advanced track, um, we can really just group all of you guys as sort of at these three levels of understanding. Um, the first level is pretty simple. Um, my favorite example of this is uh, perhaps when you're starting out working on a project or in an introductory computer science or data course, you may get told to run some command um, and you perform it and something happens. And that's really as simple as um, people's initial understanding of the shell goes. This is definitely my experience when I first touched the shell. Something like git clone um, a repository uh, definitely seems like magic when you first run it, as in you have this box of input, you run this command, and then boom, suddenly a directory and a bunch of stuff appears in it. And really that's as far as you need to understand things. On the next level, we sort of have being able to use programs to do what you want. This can also be very simple. Uh, running a command like ls to see the sort of files and directories in your working directory um, is an example of wanting to do something and knowing the program to actually execute it. Um, but this obviously can get a lot harder depending on the thing you actually want to do. But you guys have pro probably all worked at least with a few commands um, that you sort of memorized, uh, maybe good at performing individual different jobs, uh, whether that be grep for finding specific things in input. And at a final level, we have the ability to express uh, much more complicated behavior by putting commands together um, manipulating output and sort of understanding as a whole the sort of things that the shell can do for you. So now I'm going to dive into a short demo. Um, the intention of which isn't exactly to solve the sort of problems that you'll be seeing on your lab or to do super complicated stuff in the shell itself, um, but really hopefully I'll be able to open your mind a little bit um, as to what the shell can actually accomplish for you as well as maybe helping you get a little bit more familiar with it. Um, so jumping into that, we have a list here of a bunch of common shell commands. Um, some of these may be very familiar to you, some really maybe a lot less so, as well as a little bit of control flow stuff that uh, can be a little bit more advanced. So I don't intend to dive into all of this sort of stuff, uh, but I wanted to familiarize you guys with stuff that you may not have already known about the shell, but you perhaps have interacted with or touched with before, but never truly understood. So let's jump into that. So in this demo, I'm just gonna sort of go through some of the shell commands that were listed in the last slide. Um, I won't go too in depth in each of them, but hopefully I'll give you guys some of the starting tools that you guys can start working with. So you have at least uh, some basis for starting out on lab A1. Um, 
So as you can see here, I'm currently just in my home directory. Um, I'm running Zeesh, by the way, but that shouldn't really matter. Um, and we can see that if I type a command like ls, I can see the files that are in the current working directory that I'm already in. Um, this is probably something that's pretty familiar to people that have interacted with the shell before, um, is the concept of the file tree that we have to traverse. I can use a command like pwd to see where I am right now, and I can see that I'm in my user home directory. Great. To move around, we can go ahead and move into a test folder that I've already made. And we can look in here and see that there's nothing currently in this folder. So from here, let's go ahead and start playing around with some basic file operations and sort of see what things that we can do. Um, we can go ahead and create an empty file by using touch. So we can make a file like this. And we can see that we created this file called Bernard. Now touch should create an empty file, so we can go ahead and list the contents of the file using cat. And we see there isn't really anything there. So let's go ahead and, and try to edit it. There's a few common terminal-based text editors like nano and vim. Um, you can really choose whatever you want, whatever you find simplest, but they really all work the same as in they edit text within the terminal. So let's go ahead and open up this file. This demo isn't really about how to use vim in specific either. I recommend if you're interested in something like that to go look into something like vim tutor. Really here, I just wanted to fill this file with some random text. And there we go. So now if we actually list the file contents again, we can see that everything I've added to that file is printed when I run cat. All right. We can look at the head and tail commands. We could look at head. So the next common command I wanted to show was head, um, which is supposed to show the first few lines at the head of a file. And by default, it shows the first 10 lines. And this was something that I wanted to, to change by passing in an actual argument for, the, how, for how many lines I wanted to show. But I ended up actually forgetting the syntax for the head command itself. Um, so what did I do? I, I ran this command called man. And man is meant to show the man pages for commands and show you a bit of documentation about how to use it. So what I did here was when running man head, I can see a lot of information about how this command is supposed to work. Um, and in here I can see in the description that the dash n argument is used to provide the number of lines instead of the first 10. So that's great. And running this command now gives us the first line of the file that we just created. And tail. Uh, if, you can, if you haven't guessed already, really does like the same thing. So instead of giving us the first line in the file, this now gives us the last. So far, I was working with this small file that I created, but perhaps this isn't the best example. Um, if you go ahead and look at the files in my actual home directory, we can see that I have the text of Moby Dick in a TXT file at my home directory. So let's go ahead and move it into this test directory, which we can do by the move command. The move command, like a lot of other commands that interact with files, all have a source argument and a destination argument. So in this case, I want to move this file, uh, which I can, which is in the directory above the test directory, which is my home root directory, and I want to move that into this directory itself, which I can do with this command. And if I go ahead and look, I can see that now. Hooray! I have all the text of Moby Dick. And now, when we run the head, uh, the head command on this massive file, we can see the first 10 lines, and we can run the tail file and also see the bottom 10. Hooray. But let's go ahead and try catting this entire file. What happens? <laughs> 
a whole ton of text comes out. And this really sucks because it's really, really hard for us to scroll through all of this and find anything that we actually really want, right? This seems pretty useless. So what can we do instead if we sort of want to inspect the, the, contact, the content of the file itself? Well, one command that we can use is less. So you can see when we open the file using less, the contents of the file are shown in our in our terminal, but here we only see the first section of the actual book itself. Um, to move through the file, we can hit the spacebar and the key B to move back up. And this is sort of all done from entering input in this sort of command prompt we have here, while the text of, from what we see is displayed up top. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff that we can enter in here. The most useful one, in my opinion, is pattern matching. So we can use a backslash. We can use a pattern to search for a word like the. And then we can use keys like n to move to the next iteration, the next occurrence of this word, and also capital N to move back. So this is pretty useful when we actually want to find a text find a word in the text. So maybe we can try looking for something more crazy. Uh, maybe a word like boat. We can also press Q to quit, which is pretty common among a lot of shell commands. But let's say that we don't want to actually look through the we don't want to actually search through the text ourselves. What can we actually do to find words or find lines in this huge chunk of text? Um, a very common command that you guys may have heard of is grep. Um, Again, we can search for the word boat in this giant huge set of text. And we can find all the lines in this actual book with the word boat in it, which is pretty incredible. Um, and not to mention, there's many other options that grep has uh, that do uh, things a lot more complicated than just searching for lines with that specific word. So, so far, I've been using these, these commands by themselves, but when you begin to put them together, you can start to do much more complicated things. For example, the best example of this is piping, which you guys are probably all somewhat familiar with. Um, we can go and pipe the content of one command into the input of another. So using commands that I've shown you so far, we can go ahead and grep the output of ls for a specific word, or I guess in this case, letter. Let's go ahead and find all the lines with the letter e in it. And we can see that Bernard comes up but the Moby Dick text does not. And this is probably the simplest example of this that I can show, but there's much more complicated things that we can do. Uh, next, I kind of want to show off the sed command, which is a stream text editor. For example, let's say in the Moby Dick text, we wanted to replace every instance of the word boat with something else, like let's say cat. Well, then we can go ahead and print out the content of the, of the book itself, and then pipe that into sed, from which then we can do something like this. And we can now see that all the lines that previously had the word boat, like a rocking boat, are now rocking cat. Isn't that cute? We can even make network requests using basic commands in the shell. You guys may have heard of curl, and we can go ahead and use it to get the content at the main OCF website. And would you look at that? It gives us a whole bunch of HTML, which is what we'd expect from visiting the site directly. We could even save it to a file. What I did here was redirect the output of this command. Um, 
So normally, when running curl this way, the content of this command will go to our standard output, which is why we see it show up in our terminal immediately after running this command. But using this arrow here, we can redirect the content into a new file that we decide to create. There's some pretty simple syntax. And we can go ahead and look at the content of, of this file to see that, hey, it's really all there. So I know that I mentioned that I wasn't going to cover exactly how every single piece of the shell works, but there's still some pieces that you should probably know about so that you do have at least some understanding of what's going on under the hood. The question I want to answer is how exactly does piping work? And the answer to this involves a lot of things. Every command that I provide to the terminal, no matter what it is, when ran, spawns a process. Um, and you'll learn more about what a process is in later lectures, but just know that whenever these processes are initialized, they always start out with their own standard input and standard output, which are default file descriptors, which pretty much are streams of text that by default manage the input and output of a program. So when we do something like um, using a program that has output, when we pipe it into a command that takes input, really it's as simple as redirecting the standard output of one to the standard input of another. Now underneath the hood, something like a pipe will actually allocate a page and a whole bunch of other stuff. But just know that these systems sort of exist and this will be expanded on a lot later. Writing and using a function in the shell is a feature that probably most of you have never really used before. But I think a simple function like this serves as a good example as to how these commands and functions consume and output pieces of text. Like any command that we've used previously, hello in this case can be called with a set of arguments. For example, I can provide my first and last name, and the text I provided will be printed out in the, when the function is ran because the dollar sign one and dollar sign two variables here uh, correspond to the first and second argument of the function that I was just ran. More commonly, you'll see these sort of functions in shell scripts. Well, people will write operations that can be performed in the shell into a file. All of the commands that I've run so far also have something called an exit code. This code is meant to tell us whether or not the last command was successful. And we can access it by looking at the dollar sign question mark variable. In this case, the exit code that we have is zero, which indicates success. And that makes sense because the script above succeeded in printing the input that we wanted. But let's try something else. Let's try a command that will obviously fail. Like, for example, let's try to move directories in a directory that doesn't actually exist. Um, something like this. And you can see that when we actually look at the exit code, it is no longer zero, indicating a failure. Using the exit code, we can do some pretty cool stuff. For example, we can chain commands only if the first, the previous command was successful. Uh, for example, we can list all the files in our directory and then we can say hello. And we'll see that these two things ex uh, execute one after another. The, ants, the ampersand symbols I use here indicate the and if operator. So if I were to do something similar to before, where I try to move into a directory that doesn't exist, but then and try to do something if and only if the last command succeeded, we'll see that the second command here doesn't actually execute. So now that you guys have seen some of the cool stuff we can do in the shell and some of the commands that we can invoke and how we can put some of them together, we can now take a look at how all of this is put together into things like small shell scripts. So as an example, I've already created this script here called Fibonacci. So we can go ahead and take a look at that. And you'll instantly notice a bunch of different things about this script, and I'm just going to go through these things individually. So at the start, at the top of the script, we see something that's called a shebang. And while this does look like a comment, just like the line below it, the idea here is that this line should tell your interpreter what it should use to actually run this script. Um, when I say shell script, I really mean a script that's written in a shell language like Bash. But in reality, these shebangs can specify all sorts of languages like Python as a way to run a script. 
The next thing you might immediately notice is some of the syntax that this script involves. We see things like if, um, then, phi, exit. All of these keywords sound like things that control the flow of how this script actually runs, and you would be correct. In fact, it may look similar to other programming languages that you've interacted with. So the first thing that we see here is an if statement. The if here, as expected, pretty much controls whether or not we enter this block of code inside of here or not, and it ends with a phi, which may not immediately seem logical, but we close an if statement with if reversed. Then we can take a look at the sort of statement that we are evaluating. Um, in this case, we're asking whether or not this dollar sign pound variable is equal to zero. This may seem confusing as in there's no actual command here being run that's testing equality, but these specific brackets are actually running something called the test command under the hood, which is meant to test equality. The dollar sign pound argument here specifies how many arguments have been received. So it makes sense that if this value is zero, then this Fibonacci script hasn't actually received an argument. And we exit with a non-zero status code, meaning that we erred. Below that, we see the Fibonacci function, which looks pretty similar to the hello world function I showed earlier. Now, I'm sure you all can guess what this function actually does, but seeing how it does it is the interesting part. We start with a statement where we assign dollar sign one to this variable n. Dollar sign one is our first argument, so in this case, it would simply be the number of the Fibonacci number that we want to find. The statement below is another if block, which checks whether or not the argument that's passed in is a positive integer, as in Fibonacci doesn't really make much sense without one. And while the statement seems sort of complicated, again, the if statement uses the brackets and some more complicated logic to get this done. Below that, we have some more control flow statements with if, elif, and else statements that look at some base cases of small Fibonacci numbers. And then a very interesting line here at the bottom. So if you haven't guessed already, this function here seems to be recursively calling itself to actually find out what the nth Fibonacci number is, which is really cool. It's amazing that something that you might find in normal programming language can be expressed in the actual shell that you're working in. And there's a few quirks that I want to point out here. There's a whole mess of parentheses in this line, but the ones that I want you to pay attention to are how sometimes one follows a dollar sign and sometimes two of these parentheses follow a dollar sign. In Bash, the double parentheses and dollar sign is a mathematical evaluation of the statement inside. So even though the variable n, which is the argument passed into this script, is in fact text, its value will be evaluated mathematically within these parentheses. On the other hand, we have this fib statement with an argument following it that's inside a statement with a dollar sign and a single parenthesis. In this case, that statement is actually going to be evaluated, and the value it returns will be the actual result. And lastly, we see that we call this function with the argument provided to the script to kick off this entire recursive process. So while this does seem pretty magical, I hope you can also see how this seems maybe a little bit overly complicated. Not having integer types makes this sort of logic hard, and implementing this in a language like Python would probably be a lot easier. But nevertheless, I just wanted to demonstrate that a lot of the typical behavior you might find familiar in a programming language can often be expressed in the shell, which makes it very, very powerful. So onto a script that maybe is a little bit more realistic to what you might find in the real world. So here I have this script called Sync Archive. This script brings back a lot of memories because this is one of the first contributions I ever made to the OCF, which was modifying and creating this script for our mirrors service. The OCF mirrors software, which means we host a copy of open source software like Arch Linux in this example and distribute it to people who are closer to us so that their downloads are faster. The overall context of this script is that we want to make sure that the copy that we're hosting is up to date with the upstream source. And while I won't go into the exact behavior behind every single line of this script, there's two important things that I wanted to point out. One is that again, pretty complicated and expressive behavior can be expressed in a simple shell script. We see that in this line here, we're checking with curl to see the last update time of Arch Linux. And then we see the difference between that and when we last updated our mirror. And then from there, perform the correct behavior in the case that a new update is necessary. Second, there may be syntax in the script that even people familiar with shell scripting may not immediately recognize. 
for example, this line here, we substitute and execute this command, is something that's actually very unique to Bash. These things are traditionally called Bashisms, which are pieces of behavior unique to Bash and can make your life a lot easier. But the thing I wanted to point out here is how not all shells are the same. Writing lines like these or using the double brackets in this line may not give you the same results depending on what shell you use, which again, all calls back to how important the shebang at the top of the file really is. And while a lot of this syntax may look very complicated or intimidating at a first glance, I'm confident that with your guys' Google skills, reading and developing these shell scripts is really just a matter of knowing where to put what. But I hope I've sort of showed off some of the cool things that can be done. So now we can jump into a little bit about the history and core concepts behind Unix and Linux, um, and hopefully clear up some of the confusion behind a lot of this terminology in general. Uh, I feel like Unix, Linux, uh, GNU, and all these things seem uh, like just terms that you may have heard of relating to a lot of this sort of stuff, uh, but you also may not understand how these pieces all sort of fit together. So we're gonna go ahead and dive a little bit into that. Um, so Unix as an operating system started out a long, long time ago in the 1960s when Bell Labs and MIT worked together to make this operating system called Multix, um, which was meant to have all these really cool you know, features um, and things like multiprocessing, and it ultimately didn't pan out. But one of the people who worked on this, Ken Thompson, took a lot of the great ideas from Multics and other operating systems at the time um, and put it all into Unix, which is a project that sort of sought to have a lot of those same features, but with a lot less complexity um, and with a much more simpler developer-friendly design. And those sort of things made Unix very popular in the coming years. And many other derivatives um, like BSD, Solaris, other operating systems uh, grew as sort of forks and offshoots of Unix itself. And from then on, Unix only grew in popularity, even with things like Bell Labs breaking up um, and at and being formed, didn't stop Unix from growing in popularity. And a lot of the legal troubles that surrounded Unix and its sort of offshoots um, inspired the growth of Linux, which was a copyleft rewrite of Unix, uh, which is the main way that we interact with Unix today. And Linux nowadays is a very popular operating system. <laughs> uh, the final bullet point is a bit of a joke, as in, if you know anything about Linux, its popularity isn't exactly in the common desktop that people use. Uh, but servers today around the world are all primarily running Linux. And that's why it's so important as sysadmins uh, to know a lot about Linux, as in most of the servers we interact with and administer are all running Linux nowadays. So from that short gist of Unix and Linux's history, um, I hope it's clear that the main distinction from Linux um, and its Unix history is really the idea that it is truly free software as a copyleft version, which I'll dive a little bit more into later when we talk about free and open source software. Uh, but the movement behind it and the software itself are pretty inseparable. You may be wondering what GNU stands for, or one that has to do with Linux. And in short, GNU actually really is the operating system we call Linux. Um, so the terms are used pretty interchangeably nowadays, even though in specific Linux refers to the kernel. But GNU as an acronym stands for GNU is not Unix, which is a funny sort of recursive acronym. But it serves to show how Linux itself was meant to be very separate from Unix, although by design it is very similar. And, and the main difference here is the fact that GNU and Linux are free software, unlike Unix and the legal troubles that followed it in its history. That's not to say that Linux as we know it today is the only relevant offshoot of Unix. You guys may have heard of BSD before, a Unix derivative from Berkeley, Go Bears. Um, mainly because of it, the important things that BSD implemented and are a core part of the operating systems that we know today. Features like Berkeley's networking sockets um, are things that are pretty much present on all operating systems nowadays, and we can really thank BSD for implementing that. While people don't really run BSD itself nowadays, if you're running Mac OS, uh, you are running a BSD derivative. Um, so at the end of the day, it all trails back to Unix. So this is supposed to be a graph of Unix's history over the past few decades. Um, and at least for me, I don't even recognize half the terms 
um, on this chart, but it really goes to show how the, the ecosystem of operating systems that is sort of spawned because of Unix um, and how that sort of affected a lot of the software that we interact with today. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. So now that we've seen that Unix has had a long, long history, we have to sort of ask ourselves what part of Unix has sort of maintained its popularity as software over all these decades? And what about it makes it still relevant for us to talk about today? At a high level, really all of the design decisions made back when Unix was first designed are still very, very relevant today. Uh, when I talked about how Ken Thompson originally designed the operating system to be generic and very simple, um, that proved to be very appealing for developers as the simplicity of the software itself made it very simple and almost fun to interact with. As you maybe sort of saw in my shell demo, and you definitely will see in our lab, a lot of the features that Unix has, even in the shell with its, with its commands that do very simple and individual things, can be pieced together to do really, really complicated and impressive things as a larger program. And this sort of all goes back to Unix's original philosophies, um, where all of its software is supposed to be simple, modular, and do one thing and one thing only very, very well. And this philosophy has definitely persisted around Unix and has been the topic of a lot of debate um, around newer and much more powerful tools that have become a part of the sort of Linux e ecosystem. If you know anything about systemd, you may be able to see ways in which, uh, when thinking along the lines of this philosophy, monoliths like systemd can seem like antithetical to the original design of Unix um, and how Unix was intended to be used. And lastly, you may have heard that in Unix, everything is a file. Um, and while that doesn't actually mean that really everything truly is a file, the concept here is that the APIs that people use to interact with files, um, the syscalls that they use to read and write to files, um, have been heavily reused in a lot of other things in the Unix ecosystem, like device drivers and stuff like that, which brings down a lot of the overhead to writing custom software when you can abstract a lot of the ways of interacting with things as if everything was a simple file with permissions um, and as a stream of bytes. So diving a little bit more into that, you may have heard of the syscalls um, to interact with files, and these are pretty obvious from a high level that you should be able to read to files, write to files, and open files. But these functions in Unix also provide a pretty generic way to interact with things that aren't just files. Um, as in anything that's a sort of stream of bytes can be tied to a file descriptor, um, and things like sockets, drivers, pipes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this really simplifies the design of a lot of these things, as in the things that you may find natural about files themselves already apply to other pieces of software. Um, the big ones here are things like permissions. <clears throat> and because of that, all of the examples listed here also have their own permissions and access control and things that you would find familiar on files themselves. So knowing all this, um, it becomes sort of clear the advantages Unix has over systems that maybe don't abide by these philosophies. A lot of the software that is a part of Unix is a lot easier for developers to understand because, in a way, the software is dumber and the software is simpler. I also cannot emphasize enough how Unix is very, very friendly to developers. Uh, let's say you want to debug something um, or see what's going on really in your system. Things like procfs, which is a file system sort of uh, delineating all the processes that are working on your system, and strace, a way to sort of trace the syscalls that are going in and out of your kernel, all examples of features that have all been a part of Unix for a very long time and allow developers to sort of see very, very closely into what your Unix system is actually doing which as you'll see through the rest of our labs, can be very, very useful. We have this funny quote here from Bill Joy, um, who was originally tasked with implementing TCP and IP on Berkeley Unix. And while this quote is sort of an exaggeration, um, I like to think that this quote does sort of show how simple extending software on Unix can really be. So now I have to talk a little bit about free and open source software and while I've already been bringing up these sort of terms when I was talking about the history of Unix and Linux itself, uh, the concepts of free and open and licensing are all things that 
while they may not be immediately applicable to you and what you intend to do with what you learn in this decal, are really important to really all the software that you'll be interacting with this entire semester. So to begin with, we have a strange question that we need to answer in the first place, which is, what is free software? Um, so right away, I'll tell you, free software doesn't exactly mean free as in free of payment, but ra rather, it's a sort of question about intellectual property. When you write software, when you write the code, who owns it? Uh, you know, what does it mean to own code in specific? Um, does that mean that you have the exclusive rights to use it? Uh, does that mean that you're the only one who can distribute it? Does that mean that someone who copies your code can be sued? Really, this is a whole host of questions that, that begins to sort of cross the border into more moral and uh, uh, legal questions more than anything else. There's a, maybe a few terms that you've already heard me bring up, and I'd like to at least define some of those. At the top of this slide, we can also see a scale of the freeness of different licenses. Um, for example, you may be familiar with open source, uh, which, as you guessed, is pretty free, <clears throat> as in you have access to the source code. But we also have licensing that's even more free, which we'll talk about a bit more later, like copyleft. Um, and other things like closed source code um, are a lot less free, as in the source is not something you should be able to see at all. I guess at this point, we should also sort of dive into what the definition of free and free software really does mean. The Free Software Foundation has given us these sort of definitions, and you'll find that most of these tenants sort of answer the questions about code ownership that we had in the last slide. Uh, for example, we have the freedom to run your program. We have the freedom to study how the program works um, ha by having access to the source code. We have the freedom to redistribute copies of the actual code itself. Um, and we have the freedom to also modify and distribute code. So with that framework in mind, let's look at a very, very common license that's pretty commonly seen on a lot of GitHub repositories and open source software today, which is the MIT license. And if you want to read this, you can just pause here or just Google more about the license online. But it seems pretty short and pretty succinct. And the main reason for this is the MIT license um, is a BSD li license, as in it's a permissive and simple license that really just says, you can go ahead and use our code, but just don't sue us and respect our patent rights. Um, and really that's about it. And the simplicity of this license is part of the reason why it's so popular, as in it really just says, hey, this is open source. Um, and really that's as far as this licensing goes. So for a more complicated license, uh, the GNU public license uh, is a little bit different. So again, you can pause here if you want to sort of read this. But jumping on into this, this is what I originally referred to as a copyleft license. So while the MIT license sort of says that, hey, this is open source and you can do whatever you want with it, um, the idea behind the copyleft license is that if you intend to build off of this code and uh, let's say develop your own fork and build on top of the original source, that iteration that you produce must also have this same copyleft license. Um, and from there, it has this sort of viral effect as in any software that has grown off of code starting with this copyleft license will also continue to do so as the software continues to grow. An example of this is, let's say there is some open source piece of software that um, I want to work on. And let's say that I take a huge chunk of the source code to build my corporate product um, and that I can then treat as closed source. That would perfectly be fine if the code was from an, M, uh, if that code had an MIT license, um, as in I can really do whatever I want with it. And in this case, I've now transitioned my own code that has now worked on top of it into its own closed source version. However, if I intended to do something like this off of uh, code that has a copyleft license, like the GNU license, suddenly I'm in a very different situation where I cannot build on top of this code and also make it closed source. And a great quote here from the very famous Steve Ballmer is, is that he called this license a cancer that attaches itself in an intellectual property sense to everything it touches, which uh, is a little abrasive, but honestly pretty descriptive as to how this license is attended, intended to work. So lastly, I've talked a lot about the concepts of free and open source software, 
Uh, but you may be wondering why go through all this trouble in the first place? Why are we talking about free and open source software at all? And really, the main reason behind this is without free and open source software, there really isn't anything, there wouldn't really have been anything for us to talk about today in the first place. All the software that we've interacted with today, and probably almost all of the software that we'll be interacting with for the rest of the semester, is all built on top of or is free and open source software. Um, even at the OCF, everything that we run, all the code that we write, all the services that we deploy are all free and open source. And there's many reasons as to why free and open source software has become so popular over the past few decades. There's some reasons listed here, and I'd like you to sort of just think for a second about how free and open source software can help you in each one of these sort of categories. Firstly, free and open source software from a monetary standpoint really is free. Um, as in, if you have access to the source code, you can run it, you can build it and run it yourself. And you don't really have to, and you can avoid the entire cost of needing to write code from scratch. Not to mention the ability to have a community of people who will continue to maintain software as time progresses, which is very easy to see with examples like Linux, which has now had a life of decades on decades. On the other hand, we can look at security. Uh, and in the case where things are open source and people can view the source code directly, it may be a lot easier for people to find bugs and security um, in critical pieces of software if the code is open and available for people to simply look at and try to debug. <clears throat> From a privacy standpoint, the transparency of having open source software, again, allows people to sort of look into the code and ask questions about what software may be doing in regards to your own privacy. Control is also a major factor as maybe there is some feature of, of some free and open source software that you don't like. Well, no one's stopping you from forking the software and building your own version without it or with different features. Um, and this is something that's pretty commonly done in the ecosystem of free and open source software. And lastly, and probably the most importantly, we have collaboration. Uh, as in all of the pieces of free and open source software on this slide really could not have been done with an individual person. But because of the fact that the code is free and open source, the barriers for people to collaborate and work together on stuff really is very, very low. You don't have to be in the same company. You don't have to be even in the same country. But really, everybody has the ability to view and build on top of the code that is publicly shared in open source. Finally, we have a small note on terms. This is stuff that the original creator of this lecture wanted to mention. Um, and I'll let you pause it here if you want another reminder or clarification about what these actual terms specifically mean. But really, that's all I had today. Um, thanks, everybody, for following along. Um, we have some resources on this slide. And while you won't be able to click on them in this recorded lecture, I recommend that you open these slides um, using a link on the website or the short URL that I mentioned earlier um, to look into some of these if you're interested in learning more about the history of Unix or just some more generic stuff to make yourself a better Linux user. But other than that, um, thank you everybody for following along and have fun working on the lab.